Good evening, everybody. Hello, I'm Ben Powell. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Welcome uh, for what I'm sure is going to be a very enjoyable and informative evening with Jason Riley. Before I introduce him, I do want to uh, briefly recognize a couple of co-sponsors of tonight's event. First, the Federalist Society here at Texas Tech. Thank you for co-sponsoring and bringing your people out with you. And also the Manhattan Institute, uh, where Jason is a senior fellow, uh, is also a co-sponsor of the event and aided in bringing him here tonight. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize, although not an official sponsor of the event, uh, the Diane Graves Owen Foundation, uh, which is out of Abilene and has supported the Free Market Institute in the past. But kind of the inspiration from this event came from when I was reading through Maverick when it first came out, like any good academic, I flipped through the acknowledgments to see how many of my friends I was going to see in there. And as I was reading through it, it recognized financial support from the Diane Owen Foundation. And I said, oh, they've been a supporter of the Free Market Institute in the past. Wouldn't it be fun if we did an event together promoting this book that they, they've helped uh, bring about? Uh, so it was them and then an email from the Manhattan Institute uh, uh, promoting Jason and his work uh, that inspired getting tonight's event together. So, allow me please to introduce Jason. He is an editorial board member and opinion columnist at the Wall Street Journal, where his column, Upward Mobility, has run since 2016. He's also, as I mentioned, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and you have also can see him on various <laughs> television shows, including the Wall Street Journal editorial board show, uh, but sometimes Fox and Friends and other shows as well. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree, not in economics, but in English, from the State University of New York at Buffalo, where he's also originally from. He joined the paper in 1994 as a copy editor on the National News Desk in New York, and he moved to the editorial page in 1995 and was named a senior editorial page writer in 2000 and became a member of the editorial board in 2005. Uh, he joined the Manhattan Institute more recently in 2015. He is the recipient of the Bradley Prize. He is also the author of four books, one we were discussing on our way over here earlier, Let Them In, The Case for Open Borders, Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, False Black Power, and the one that he's here tonight to talk about, Maverick, a biography of Tom Sowell. Please join me in welcoming Jason Riley to Texas Tech. Professor Powell, um, and thanks to all of you for being here uh, this evening. Uh, before the pandemic, I did a fair amount of speaking on, on, on college campuses uh, when they let me speak on college campuses. And, uh, and while it's, uh, it's nice to be back uh, speaking in person at schools, um, I, I know better than to take these opportunities for granted. Um, at a time when our colleges and universities seem to be getting more and more intellectually intolerant, it's good to know that we have places like Texas Tech and programs like the Free Market Institute um, that understand the role of college and the purpose of higher education. Uh, some of you may know, a few years ago, the University of Chicago began sending out letters to incoming freshmen that explain the school's commitment to academic freedom and how they don't support trigger warnings or safe spaces or cancel invited speakers based on topics that might prove controversial. Uh, they used to go without saying uh, on college campuses. Now it needs to be stated explicitly in writing to incoming students, which says something about where we are today. Uh, college ought to be a place where students are exposed to different points of view, uh, where their sensibilities are challenged, where they learn to grapple with alternative perspectives and formulate coherent responses. Uh, where do you learn the difference between a slogan and an argument? Uh, on a lot of campuses, that's not happening, or at least it's not happening to the extent that it should be. On a lot of campuses, students are being taught what to think instead of how to think. They're being pushed toward preconceived ideological conclusions on economics, on the environment, on race, and so forth, rather than being taught how to analyze issues in a way that allows them to reach independent conclusions. Uh, even worse, students are being encouraged to silence or cancel people they disagree with rather than debate them. 
uh, all of which makes places like Texas Tech and programs like this one not only important but essential in today's environment. And I'm again honored, honored to be here this evening. I thought I'd spend a few minutes uh, talking about the economist Thomas Sowell, uh, someone who's had a huge influence on my own journalism and, and why so much of his scholarship continues to be relevant to our public policy debates today. Uh, when I was researching my biography, I kept coming across Sowell's own descriptions of scholars he admired. And I was often struck by how well those descriptions applied to Sowell himself. Um, for example, after the Nobel Prize winning economist George Stigler, who was one of Tom's professors at the University of Chicago, passed away, Tom wrote this. In a world of self-promoting academics, George Stigler epitomized a rare integrity as well as a rare intellect. He jumped on no bandwagon, beat no drum for causes, created no personal cult. He did the work of a scholar and a teacher, both superbly, and found that sufficient. If you wanted to learn, and above all, if you wanted to learn how to think, how to avoid vague words and fuzzy thoughts, maudlin sentiments that cloud over reality, then Stigler was your man. Or here's Tom describing another one of his mentors, Milton Friedman, whom he also studied under at Chicago. Friedman, he said, was one of the very few intellectuals with both genius and common sense. He could express himself at the highest analytical levels to his fellow economists and academic publications, and still write popular books that could be readily understood by people who knew nothing about economics. I'm hard-pressed to come up with better ways than those to describe Thomas Sowell. When I think about a scholarship, whether the subject is economics, history, or culture, or race, or political philosophy, that's what comes to mind. Intellectual integrity, analytical rigor, respect for evidence, skepticism toward the kind of fashionable thinking that comes and goes. And then there's the clarity in column after column book after book, written in plain English for the general public consumption. In 2020, at the age of 90, Sowell published book number 36. The title is Charter Schools and Their Enemies. And I hope Tom's not done writing books, but if he is, you could hardly find a more suitable swan song for a publishing career that has now spanned six decades. Tom's first two books, were directed at students of economics. But his third book, the semi-autobiographical Black Education, Myths and Tragedies, was published in 1972 and written for the general public. It grew out of a long article on college admission standards for black students that he wrote for the New York Times Magazine in 1970 after leaving his teaching post at Cornell. And it begins with a recounting of his own education, first at segregated schools in North Carolina where he was born and later at integrated schools in New York City's Harlem neighborhood, where he was raised. The topic of education, both at the K-12 through level and at the college level, is something he's returned to repeatedly in his books over the decades. In the preface to Charter Schools and Their Enemies, he describes a conversation he had in the early 1970s with Irving Kristol, who was the editor of a quarterly called The Public Interest. When Kristol asked Tom what could be done to create high quality schools for blacks, Tom replied that such schools already existed and had for generations. Uh, Crystal asked Tom to write about these schools for his magazine. And a 1974 issue of the Public Interest featured a long essay by Tom on the history of all black Dunbar High School in Washington, which had not only outperformed its local white counterparts in DC, but had repeatedly equaled or exceeded national norms on standardized tests throughout the first half of the 20th century. Over an 85 year span, from 1870 to 1955, Tom wrote, most of Dunbar's graduates went on to college, even though most Americans, white or black, did not. Two years later, in the same publication, he wrote a second article on successful black elementary and high schools located throughout the country. In a sense, today's Public charter schools 
with, which often have predominantly low-income black and Hispanic student bodies, are successors to the high-achieving black schools that Tom researched more than 40 years ago. And as Tom points out, what's clear is that these charter schools are not simply doing a better job than traditional public schools with the same demographic groups. In many cases, inner-city charter school students are outperforming their peers in the wealthiest and whitest suburban school districts in the country. In New York City, for example, the Success Academy Charter School Network has effectively closed the academic achievement gap between black and white students. As Sol explains, quote, the educational success of these charter schools undermines theories of genetic determinism. It undermines claims of cultural bias and tests. It undermines assertions that black students must be sitting next to white students in order to learn. It undermines the presumption that family income differences explain differences in educational outcomes. This last claim about poverty has been used for decades to absolve traditional public schools of any responsibility for the educational failures in low-income communities. It's clear that charter schools have such vocal and passionate enemies, not because they don't work, but because they do work. And therefore, they pose a threat to the education status quo. They threaten the current power balance that allows the interest of adults who run public education to come before what's best for the students. Bad schools stay open because those schools still provide good jobs for adults. Whether or not the children are learning is a secondary concern at best. But as Sol writes, schools exist for the education of children. Schools do not exist to provide ironclad jobs for teachers. They do not exist to provide billions of dollars in union dues for teachers' unions, or to provide monopolies for educational bureaucracies. And they certainly don't exist to provide a captive audience for indoctrinators. In recent years, charter school skeptics have made headway. Limits have been placed on how many can open, where they can be located. Bill Clinton and Barack Obama both supported charter schools. But Democrats and progressives have moved sharply to the left on education more recently. And the rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration is far more skeptical of charter schools. All of which makes Tom's book as timely as anything he's ever written. One of the reasons I wanted to write this biography is because so much of Tom's scholarship, not just on education, remains relevant to our public policy debates today. We're still talking about economic inequality, affirmative action, social justice, critical race theory, slavery reparations, the efficacy of minimum wage laws, the pros and cons of immigration, and so forth. Tom's writings have addressed all of these topics. Frankly, I find it depressing that so many people today know names like Ta-Nehisi Coates, and Ibram Kendi, and Nicole Hannah-Jones, Cornell West, but not Thomas Sowell. Sowell's scholarship runs circles around those individuals, <laughs> maybe around all of them put together, frankly. But it's not just the volume of Tom's writings that surpasses those other individuals. It's also the range and the depth and the rigor of this thinking, which they don't come close to matching. He anticipated many of their arguments decades ago and refuted them decades ago, in some cases before the people making them today were even born. To the extent that Tom is known, it's mostly for his writings on racial controversies. But most of his books are not on racial themes. And Sol would have distinguished himself as a first-rate scholar, even if he'd never written a single word about race and ethnicity. Another reason I wanted to write the book was to showcase his writings in these other areas. Tom is an economist by training, specializing in the history of economic thought and ideas. But he's also an historian, a sociologist, a political philosopher, a social theorist. One person described him as one of our great intellectual trespassers, someone unafraid to go wherever his talent takes him. Sowell says his favorite of his own books is A Conflict of Visions. 
And if you want to get inside his head, it's certainly the book to read. It's a book about the history of ideas. He tries to explain what drives our ideological disputes about freedom, equality, and justice, and so forth. And he traces these ideas back at least two centuries to thinkers like William Godwin, and Immanuel Kant, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, down through John Rawls and the social justice advocates today. The con conflicting or contrasting visions he describes in the book are the constrained or tragic view of human nature and the unconstrained or more utopian view. People with a more constrained view of human, the human condition see mankind as hopelessly flawed. They see inherent limits to human betterment. We might want to end war or poverty or racism, for example, but that's probably not going to happen. Therefore, our focus should be on putting in place institutions and processes that help us deal best with problems we're probably never going to solve entirely. On the other side, you have that unconstrained or utopian view of human nature, which basically rejects the idea that there are limits to what humans can achieve. This is the belief that nothing is unattainable. And moreover, no trade-offs are necessary. Everything is available to all who want it. According to this perspective, through the proper amount of reason and willpower, we can not only manage problems like inequality and racism, but solve them entirely. In a conflict of visions, Sowell argues that depending on which view you embrace, there are a whole host of public policies you're likely to support or oppose. The book explains why two people, similarly well-informed, similarly well-meaning, will reach opposite conclusions, not just on a given issue, but on a whole range of issues. Taxes, rent control, school choice, military spending, judicial activism, and so forth. When Kant said, from the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing can ever be made, he was exhibiting the constrained view. When Rousseau said man is born free but everywhere in chains, he was voicing the unconstrained view. When Oliver Wendell Holmes said that his job as a justice was to make sure the game is played according to the rules, whether he liked them or not, it was a constrained view. But when Earl Warren said that his job as a justice was to do what he thinks is right, regardless of the law. It was an unconstrained view. This is the philosophical framework, the, the template, so to speak, that explains Sowell's writings on almost any topic, from economics to migration to education to race to culture. And if you really want to understand where Sowell is coming from, um, this is where he really lays it out. Last year, Sowell was awarded something called the Hayek Prize. It's, of course, named after the influential Austrian economist and political philosopher Friedrich Hayek. Because of the pandemic, Sol couldn't travel, and I was asked to accept the award on his behalf. In my remarks, I said that one of the nice things about Sol receiving this year's Hayek Award is that we know with a pretty high degree of certainty that Hayek himself would have approved of the choice. In fact, Hayek might have asked, what took you guys so long? And that's because Sowell was not only a student of Hayek's work, but also an actual student of Professor Hayek at the University of Chicago in the early 1960s. Sowell wrote a paper about the French economist Jean-Baptiste Say for Hayek's class on the history of ideas. The paper received very high remarks from Hayek and was later published an academic journal. And Hayek would later publicly praise Sowell's 1980 book on social theory, titled Knowledge and Decisions, in the most flattering terms imaginable. Hayek wrote a review of the book in Reason Magazine. My favorite part is the beginning of the review, where Hayek describes how when he first received a copy of the book, he put it aside because he was too busy with his own research to read it. Later, when he finally did get around to reading it, Tom says that he regretted having put it aside because, he said, he would have made faster progress on his own research if he had read Tom's book first. 
Later in the review, Hayek calls knowledge and decisions an original achievement that broadened the application of Hayek's own scholarship and, quote, effectively carried the approach into new fields that I had never even considered. Keep in mind that Friedrich Hayek was already Friedrich Hayek when he wrote that, meaning he'd already published A Road to Serpent. He'd already won his Nobel Prize and was already considered one of the greatest economists of the 20th century. Again, my point is that even if Sowell had never written a single word about racial preferences, this body of work in other areas would be worthy of our attention. Now, beginning in the 1970s, Sowell did turn his attention to these racial controversies. He did so, he says, out of a sense of duty, because there were things that needed to be said and there were too few others willing to say them aloud. Tom's criticisms of the direction of the civil rights movement at the time eventually got him canceled, to use today's term. Black elites in particular wanted nothing to do with him because he opposed affirmative action. And they convinced others in the mainstream media not to take Tom's views seriously, not to turn to him for a black point of view on issues of the day. Sol has long argued that the problems blacks face today involve far more than what whites have done to them in the past. It's no mystery why black activists want to keep the focus on white racism, it helps them raise money, helps them stay relevant. It's no mystery why politicians use the same tactics, because it helps them win votes. But Sol argued that it's not at all clear that a laser focus on white racism is helping the black underclass. He notes that you can spend all day, every day, pointing out the moral failings of other people, other groups, institutions, society in general. The question is whether doing so helps the people who most need help. Many of today's activists go about their business with the assumption that the only real problem facing the black underclass is white racism. A good example of this is the recent focus on policing in black communities. Do racist cops exist? Absolutely. Do some cops abuse their authority? Of course. But are poor black communities so violent because of racist cops or police brutality? And will reducing police resources improve the situation? According to the Chicago Sun-Times, there were 492 homicides in Chicago in 2019. Do you know how many of them involve police? Three. Three out of 492. If Chicago has a policing problem, it's clearly a secondary problem. During one weekend in Chicago a few years ago, 74 people were shot. One of the local hospital emergency rooms had to shut down, turn away ambulances, because there was no more room for bodies. Again, none of these shootings involved cops, not one. Young black men in Chicago or Baltimore or St. Louis may indeed leave the house each morning worried about getting shot, but not by police. Will reducing police resources really address this problem? And is that what people who live in high crime neighborhoods really want? Fewer police? Last year, there was a ballot measure put to voters in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed. It would have defunded the police. Not only was the measure defeated, it was most strongly opposed by black residents in high crime areas who want more policing, not less. And the black residents of Minneapolis are not outliers. They're typical. In a Gallup poll released in 2020, 81% of blacks nationwide said they wanted police presence in their neighborhoods to either remain the same or to increase. Another Gallup poll released a year earlier asked black and Hispanic residents of low-income neighborhoods in particular about policing. About 60% of both blacks and Hispanics said they wanted police to spend more time in the communities. In 2015, 
which is after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. A poll found that a majority of black residents said police treat them fairly. And far more blacks than whites, by a two to one margin in fact, said, quote, they wanted a greater presence of police in their local neighborhoods. Nor is this a recent phenomenon. Crime control has been a priority of blacks for a long time. In 1993, a Gallup poll found that 82% of black respondents said the criminal justice system doesn't treat criminals harshly enough. 75% of blacks wanted more cops on the street to combat crime. And 68% said we ought to build more prisons so that longer sentences can be given. Efforts to defund the police are being pushed by activists, are being pushed by liberal elites, who claim to be speaking on behalf of low-income minorities. But as the polling shows, they're mostly speaking for themselves. This is something Sol pointed out a long, long time ago. In the course of doing research for the book, I went through dozens and dozens of interviews that Sol had done over the decades. He would often be asked, how does it feel to go against the grain of so many other blacks? And Sol would inevitably correct the premise of the question. You don't mean I go against the grain of most blacks, he would respond. You mean I go against the grain of most black intellectuals, most black elites. But black intellectuals don't represent most blacks any more than white intellectuals represent most whites. And this continues to be the case today. Most blacks, for example, support voter ID laws and school choice while most black elites, your academics, your NAACPs, your Black Lives Matter activists, and so forth, oppose those things. Conversely, most blacks oppose racial preferences in college admissions. And, as I just mentioned, oppose reducing resources for law enforcement, while black elites are in favor of those things. Sol pointed out these disparities decades ago and they've only grown since then. His writings on intellectual history have stressed time and again that intellectuals are a special interest group with their own self-serving agenda and priorities and ought to be understood as such. Liberal elites control the media, by and large. They control academia, by and large. They run the foundations that hand out the intellectual awards and prizes, by and large. And Sol has refused to play footsie with them refused to pull his punches, and it has cost him. It has cost him in terms of prestige and in terms of notoriety. He has paid a price. It's one reason he is not as well known as those individuals that I mentioned earlier. I often tell people that if you think ta Coates and Nicole Hannah-Jones represent the views of most black people, you need to get to know more black people. <laughs> Sol has been right about this for a very, very long time. So why does Tom Sol still matter? Here's why. Sol is now 91 years old. He'll be 92 in June. The book he published last year was book number 36, and his fifth since turning 80. That's not too bad for a black orphan from the Jim Crow South who was born into extreme poverty during the Great Depression, who never finished high school, who didn't earn a college degree until he was 28, and who didn't write his first book until he was 40. But even aside from that impressive personal journey, soul is a rare species. He's an honest intellectual. He's someone who has consistently sought out the truth, regardless of whether it made him popular. He's been willing to follow the facts and evidence wherever they lead, even when they lead to politically incorrect results. <laughs>
It's not something that ought to distinguish you as a scholar, but these days it does. Think about the current debate that we're having over critical race theory, which really amounts to a fancy argument for racial preferences. These ideas were once relegated to college seminars. Now they're entering our workplaces through diversity training, and they're entering our elementary schools through the New York Times 1619 project, which attempts to put the institution of slavery at the center of America's founding, which is absurd. Slavery existed for thousands of years in societies all over the world long before the founding of the United States. More African slaves were sent to the Islamic world than were ever sent to the Americas. Slavery still exists today in places like Sudan and parts of Nigeria. What makes America unique is not slavery. It's emancipation. It's how fast we went from slavery to a Martin Luther King to a black president. The economic and social progress of black Americans in only a few generations is something historians have described as unmatched in recorded history. That's what makes America. <coughs> the argument that America became prosperous due to slavery is also unsupported by the facts, as Sol has pointed out. Individual slave owners certainly prospered in many cases. But that's different from saying the country as a whole benefited. The regions of the country that had slavery were the poorest regions, both during slavery and afterward. And that's true of both the US and other parts of the world. In Brazil, for example, which imported far more slaves than the US, the regions of Brazil, where slavery was concentrated, were the poorest regions, both during slavery and afterward. And of course, Brazil never became as wealthy as the US. Eastern Europe had slavery far longer than Western Europe, yet Western Europe has always been richer. Let's also remember, again, that millions of poor African slaves were sent to North Africa and the Middle East that never came to the West. If slavery produces prosperity, why did those regions remain so poor for so long? And later, when the Middle East did start to become wealthier, it wasn't due to slavery. It was due to the discovery of oil beneath the sand. In another 1619 Project essay, the author writes that, quote, for the most part, black Americans fought back alone. This is a breathtakingly ignorant assertion that simply writes out of history the role of the Quakers in the 18th century, the role of the abolitionists and the radical Republicans prior to the Civil War and Reconstruction, the role of the NAACP, which was co-founded by whites and blacks together in the early 1900s. It also ignores the role of non-blacks in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s which was noteworthy for bringing together whites and Jews and Catholics and others who fought against discrimination. But to take issue with the 1619 Project on these grounds is almost beside the point. The whole purpose of the project is to present slavery as an all-purpose explanation for racial inequality today. The argument is that blacks lag in academic performance because of slavery and Jim Crow. They lag in employment because of slavery and Jim Crow. They lag in incomes and home ownership and all the rest because of this awful history. It's part of an ongoing attempt on the political left to blame the past actions of whites for the current problems of blacks. Ultimately, it's an attempt to downplay the role of culture and the role of personal responsibility. Blacks are blameless, whites are evil. It's an attempt to push a false narrative. Whites who reject this narrative are labeled as racist. 
Blacks who rejected are dismissed as dupes or opportunists. These facts about slavery are well known among serious historians. But where are these serious historians today? A few have come forward. People like Charles Lentz and Gordon Wood and James McPherson and some others. But why so few? Why isn't the head of every history department at every major university pushing back against the 1619 Project nonsense being put <coughs> by the New York Times and Nicole Hannah Jones? and now infiltrating our K-12 school system. The nation's top scholars ought to be falling over one another, denouncing this stuff. Why have they been so relatively quiet? There have been countless books written by serious scholars about our nation's foundings. None of those books were written by Nicole Hannah Jones. Why are serious historians so afraid to take on a journalist who has never written a book about anything? Never written a serious, a, a single academic paper about anything, let alone about the history of slavery and the nation's founding. The reason they are so afraid, of course, is because taking her on is politically incorrect. They will be called racist and sexist. It might damage their academic careers. They could be deplatformed. They could be fired. This is the sort of intellectual cowardice that makes Soul's life and work unique. This is what distinguishes his scholarship. Courage. Soul was never afraid. It's the sort of thing that ought to be commonplace among scholars and intellectuals and journalists, for that matter. But clearly, it's not. Sol has spent a career putting truth above popularity. And I think we need 100 more just like him. Thank you.